to United Church of Hyde Park. It is so good to have you all with us today. It is so good to have you here. We still are working on a couple of people and trying to get them here, but we are so glad you are here. Today, I came across one of these in my room. I don't know if you guys remember, but these are name tags. And I picked up four of them. Well, I picked up three more. And this is what we have in church for people who come on a somewhat consistent basis. We make a name tag. And why do we make name tags? So we can tell people our name. We can tell them a little bit about who we are. We identify ourselves as part of United Church of Hyde Park. We are being challenged in how we get to know one another and how we identify. You guys don't have your name tags today, but you are out on, in Zoom land, and you are out in Facebook land. And so we encourage you to say hello to one another, to speak to one another, maybe even to send each other messages, to ask. You can be having conversation even while we're having church, and no one will say, shh, it's okay. We welcome you. We welcome, if Velma is listening, we welcome Velma today. We welcome Janice Cates today. We welcome Peter. We welcome everybody that's listening. We welcome you all to United Church of Hyde Park. Thank you again for joining us. We are calling you to worship. The day breaks. And God does not let us go. The hour calls. And we do not let God go. The evening falls. The struggle is real. Look how far we've come by faith. Let us turn to God in hunger and humility. God, who never turns from us and who always blesses us. Gathered here in the 
struggle and the power spirit draw near gathered here in the mystery of this hour gathered here in one strong body gathered here in the struggle and the power spirit draw Okay, that was beautiful. <laughs> I thought I had a few more minutes. <laughs> Genesis, today we are reading from the first book of the Bible. Um, for those of you that have been following us consistently on Facebook Live and Zoom, this is our third Sunday in Genesis. For those who have been coming to our lectionary Bible study, this is their fourth Sunday. I encourage all of you to come to our lectionary Bible study, which is held at 9.30, and it goes over the text that generally we're going to expound upon in service, but it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know the Bible a little bit deeper and better. And we have a really, really phenomenal, phenomenal retired professor, Jay, who teaches that class. So I wanna encourage you, if you can, on Sundays, uh, visit us in Zoom land and visit our Sunday School Bible School. Today we are reading from Genesis, the, 32, the 32nd chapter, verses 22 through 31. If you're one of those people, I encourage you to go back and just read the whole book this week. It is rich, it is rich, it is rich with our story, and it is rich with the Israelite story. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket as the thigh muscle. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, I'm a survivor. I am a survivor. Eva Hart, mom, had a foreboding sense of their trip that was coming up that she could not. To call a ship unsinkable was flying in the face of God to her mom. But her husband overrode her fear and on April the 10th, 1912, her dad, her mom, and she at seven years old boarded the brand new illustrious, I mean illustrious, illustrious, luxurious Titanic. The Titanic was part of the White Star Line and was their effort to compete with Cunard. The Titanic was a beautiful, luxury British steamship, and more than 100,000 people came out for its launching. 
The Titanic had first-class accommodations and was designed with a pinnacle of comfort and luxury with a gymnasium, a swimming pool, libraries, high-class restaurants, and opulent cabins. Remember, this was 1912. Some of the wealthiest people were on this ship. This ship bragged about being unsinkable, which maybe is why they only had one-third of the lifeboats to preserve only, I mean, they only had enough lifeboats to preserve one-third of the people that were on the ship. There were four days of uneventful sailing. They stopped at different ports and picked up people. They were headed to the United States of America. But on that fourth day, at 11.40 p.m. at night, the ship hit a little jerk. It didn't seem like nothing much if you're someone that cruises. The ship jolted a little. But it was notable, noticeable to Eva, Eva's heart's mom because her mom had determined she would not sleep any night. And so she slept during the day and every night was awake all night. When she felt the slight jerk, she bugged her husband and said, go up to the deck and just check it out. He felt a little frustrated with her because she was really going overboard with this whole worry about this unsinkable ship. But when he returned, he asked them to get ready immediately. He covered his daughter in a blanket. They left their room. They proceeded up to the deck and were put on a ship. In the beginning, they only were allowed to evacuate women and children. And so at that moment, Eva and her mom said goodbye to their dad and their husband. And they were moved away. Eva Hart and 704 women and children became known as survivors the ones who two hours later were <laughs> rescued by the rival ship Cunard. Eva Hart is a survivor. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jacob is a survivor. He has survived the loss of his father. He had survived the anger of his brother. He had survived swindling his brother two times. He had survived running away from home so that he wouldn't get killed. He had survived being promised one bride and getting another. At first glance, it seems impractical that he would be struggling in the night with a supernatural being that some call a man or an angel or even God. Here he is, <clears throat> and he can't get any rest on this night. He seems like he's greatly disturbed. But actually, what you don't see in the text today is that Jacob was about to meet his brother. His brother had sent word that he wanted to see him. His only brother, Esau, the one that he had swindled out of his inheritance, the same brother he had swindled out of the blessing that went to the oldest son, the same brother who was so upset with him, his mom sent him away. They had not seen each other in over 20 years. Jacob had fled for his life because his brother was so furious with him. And now his brother has sent word that he wants to meet with them. And so Jacob is scared. Jacob is really, really scared. And that night, he has this dream where he is wrestling with a supernatural being. So Jacob was scared of what his brother might do to him. Isn't it very interesting how those who wreak the most evil, the most harm, the most doing other things to other people, then worry about the things they do to other people being done to them? A spouse cheats on their partner, and then she or he gets the notion that the other spouse is cheating on him or her. No proof. And so she, he decides to put a camera in the car of their spouse because they want to catch them doing what they've been doing liberally. She or he sets it up and she or he travels unaware until one day their leg hits something and they discover that their spouse has put a camera in the car. But this person is not cheating. Where did the spouse get the notion from that their spouse would be cheating on them? You see, whole people have been harmed and mutated and killed, and yet they lean into forgiveness, and it stifles the enemy. It stifles the one who has done the harm, and they don't know what to do with it. And so Jacob is in distress, because Jacob fears what Esau will do to him. 
It's like when you eat that big, big, thick hamburger and it just doesn't settle at night. It is not so very odd that Jacob struggles all night, given this context, the night before he's to meet his brother. Dreams engage our uninhibited conscious or unconscious thoughts. And Jacob was now face to face with a past he had not fully dealt with and the weight of what he had done resting heavily on his shoulder. He had burned some shim bridges for sure. And he was not only struggling with this supernatural being, but he was struggling with himself. He was suddenly looking at the man in the mirror. And he doesn't have to because plenty of people run away, but Jacob stays. He stays right there in the midst of the struggle. He's convicted by his behavior in the past. He remains in the eye of the storm and a new day appears. And he declares, I won't let go until you bless me. We wrestle with things. We wrestle with why it looks like sometimes evil prevails. Have you seen any of those adventure movies lately? They are ending darker and darker. We wrestle with a country that is wrestling with the economy over human lives. For those of us who love God and God's creation, that makes absolutely no sense. We wrestle with God and sometimes discern where is God in all of this. We wrestle with that. Where are you, God? We wrestle with legislation that would seek to send people back to places they fled for fear of their lives. And if you're thinking that Chicago looks bad, we ain't got nothing on the cartel. It makes Chicago look like heaven. And that's sad. We wrestle with family members who sometimes we love, but we're not headed in the same direction as they are. And while we want to be whole and well and heal, sometimes our family members want to keep up a little bit of drama. We wrestle with aging and diminished abilities to operate independently. And like Jacob, we wrestle with things we did in the past that we have not yet made peace with as we come full circle in our lives. And it is in this quietness and stillness of night when our body lays horizontal that our stuff finds us in the middle of the night and it wrestles us and it won't let us have good sleep. But how many of us declare like Jacob, I won't let go? I am not going to let go until you bless me. Eva Hart was plagued with nightmares of the Titanic after she lost her mother at 23. You see, she lost her dad at seven years old, and then in the prime of just being a young adult, she lost her mom. And she couldn't shake that awful night and the loss of so many lives. She couldn't shake what had happened on the Titanic. Her mom would spend hours on the next ship looking for her father to no avail. And so Eva also found herself struggling. She confronted this struggle by actually booking a ship, a ticket on a ship that was headed to Singapore. She locked herself in the cabin for four days and she was petrified and she struggled. And then someone on the ship, an employee, came down to the cabin and got her. See, she had to face her own struggle, too. She knew she would never be free until she boarded another ship. And on the fourth day, when the worker brought her up to deck, she felt, she says, a freeing of her soul. The nightmares left her, and she made it to Singapore. I hope that America will wrestle with itself. I hope that America will wrestle with its past. I hope that America will wrestle with its present condition. Not only to think that we were once great, but that maybe we could be great now. I hope that America will wrestle with the sin of racism in this country. 
I hope America will wrestle with the awareness that the pursuit of liberty, justice, and happiness found in our Declaration of Independence is not available to all. I hope America has the audacity and courage to do the right thing. I hope that America will wrestle with its past. This week I learned of a boys' reform school in Florida that was opened in the 1900s. January 1st, to be exact, and it closed in 2011. At Dozier Reform School, boys were beaten and raped. A college in Florida recently, a couple years back, excavated a plot of land and found over 80 bodies. The survivors are speaking up, and they are telling their story. Interestingly enough, the people in this town are like, it wasn't that bad, they're defensive and they're trying to hush up the story from emerging. Because what does that say about me and my town? These guys said this school messed up their life. They left mean and angry and got into more crime. But I did find one guy amidst them all who left and made something of his life. He went on to become an established entrepreneur to be clear, what happened to those boys should never have happened. And sometimes what happens to people in life should not happen. And yet there are other things that happen to us that are just a part of living. Good and bad and horrific things happen to all people, no matter how religious or non-religious you are. But we are survivors. Right now we are survivors of COVID and we are survivors of other things. And as survivors, which to me is anyone that is breathing, we are going on to live our lives. For Jacob, he struggled. He showed us it's okay to struggle, but I'm not going to let go until somebody up here in this joint blesses me. He wasn't afraid to face struggle and duke it out and be in God's or whoever's face. And he shares his wealth with his brother as an atonement. He apologized to his brother. He admits that he did wrong, and he doesn't say, but. He just simply says, I was wrong. He doesn't shuck away from the responsibility. Jacob has grown so much that he even gets a new name. He's called Israel. Just apologizing can do much to help people heal. But sharing wealth? Reparations can do more. And Jacob took what he had and he shared. He showed us an example of what reparations really looks like, what it's all about. Toronto, Canada apologized to the Native Americans. The former president of South Africa apologized for apartheid. Germany apologized to the Jews. The former Prime Minister of Australia apologized to the Aborigines. Jacob shared with his brother, I was wrong. And here's some cattle and some animals because I have been blessed. And part of my blessing came off of swindling you. I mean, let's just keep it real. The best apologies simply are to confess that we are deeply sorry and we are deeply remorseful. As survivors, we can live in the shadow of what has happened to us or we can struggle and bust free. Sometimes when people act real crazy, I read their memoirs because I'm like, okay, something happened that they didn't get free from. <laughs> so, you know, I started reading about Clarence Thomas because, and I knew something happened to that brother <laughs> and he didn't get free. I'm getting a little off. <laughs> we as survivors, do not have to be defined according to Maya Angelou by what happened to us. My grandmother had this big yard. Well, the yard still exists. I mean, it's so big, it looks like it's hard for my family to even care for it. But in the country, people have big yards. They look like they're miles long of beautiful green grass. I invite you to be survivors that even regardless of what has happened in your life, what you have been through, that you have a big yard full of love, a big yard full of peace. 
a big yard full of grace. John Lewis says, hate is too big a burden to carry, and yet some of us try. The other day, like many of you, I had uh, cleaned up and I had a big bag of stuff, and I was trying to carry it and I could barely pick it up. And it took someone of stronger means to pick it up. And yet some of us as survivors are carrying around stuff that is heavy and burdensome. As survivors, we can be in the eye of the storm and ask God for whatever we want. As survivors, we can be racist or we can choose to consciously be anti-racist. As survivors, we can draw boxes around ourselves or we can see our struggle as one that links us with the human race. As survivors, we can say we are not going to let go of God until God blesses us. What an awesome statement. Okay, God, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Two years ago, I was recovering myself and sicker than a dog, but I found myself out on New Year's Eve night for some reason, and the music was going. And then they played that song, I'm a Survivor. And I mean, people hit the dance floor. And I was out there, and we were like jamming. And I was like, wow, there's a whole lot of survivors. <laughs> I'm not the only survivor. There's something about this song that resonates with us. We are survivors. But how we choose to live our life, well, that is on us. Eva Hart was one of 705 survivors. And with her life, she became a strong activist and actually was awarded. She lived into her 90s, and for all of her living, she spoke out about what happened on the Titanic is unnecessary and a human display of man's arrogance. Eva Hart vividly remembers what happened on that night. As a survivor, she remembers being out on the water. She remembers that the boats had to move out. And I didn't know this because you can be pulled in by the suction of water if you're close to a boat when it's going down. And so the boats that did escape, they were moving out to put distance between them. She said, I never closed my eyes. I didn't sleep at all. I saw it, I heard it, and nobody could possibly forget it. And I can remember the colors and the sounds, everything. The worst thing I can remember are the screams, the sounds of people hollering. And then it seemed all at once as if everything was gone, drowned, finished. The whole world was standing still. There was nothing but this deathly, terrible silence in the dark night with the stars overhead. And she said, before the ship went down, the band played one last version of Nearer My God to Thee. She said, there are three versions, but they played the one that was played in churches, Nearer My God to Thee. And Eva Hart said she never closed her eyes she saw that ship sink, and she saw that ship break in half. We, in some way or another, are all survivors of one thing or another. Live your life with as much pizzazz and boldness and love. And if you feel so inclined, get on the dance floor and proclaim that you are a survivor. Amen.
We invite you weekly to share your financial resources. We don't bamboozle you. We don't try to manipulate you. We don't try to do what the world does. We simply say we are a church that is in need of your financial support. We thank you for the support that you have given. Um, I'm gonna uh, share today that in addition to uh, sharing your financial resources, we want you to share uh, Facebook Live. Last week we looked and we saw that our viewership uh, doubled, that we had 16 shares, and that we have had about 400 views. And so we encourage you, it's not because we are being vain, it's because we believe here at United we offer a countercultural way of being community, of being together and being connected. And we want our message to be shared in the world. And one of the ways we are sharing it during these COVID times is through media. And so we encourage you to share again today. Facebook, if you're on Zoom, email folks, links. We send links later in the week. And we encourage you to continue sharing your financial resources. And I'm not going to say anymore because it's between you and God. So if you want to share your financial resources today, you can drop by the office. You can mail it or you can give electronically. And we thank you, United in Advance, for the ways in which you share your support toward us. astounds us with your love, your bounty, your abundance. 
May these financial resources share your light, and may they share your love, and may they share a way in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hello, United. Generally, when we gather together on this Sunday, I would tell you all to come down to the first five rows to draw in a little bit closer. I don't know if you remember it's communion. If you need to, please run and gather your substances. Go to the refrigerator or wherever, grab some bread or crackers, and meet us back here. I'm asking you to draw close. Share some words on Facebook. Let us know how you're doing. It is communion time. We are invited to this space. We are invited as survivors. We are invited to this table. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God Most High. Jesus invited the disciples to a table. At the beginning of service today, I talked about IDs I had. And Jesus invites Velma McDonald to the table. And Jesus invites Janice Cates to the table. And Jesus invites Peter Coyne to the table. And yes, for those of you that are listening, Jesus invites you to this table. Jesus is inviting us as survivors to a table. A table that is mixed with joys and sorrows. A table that invites us to remember Christ's death, to celebrate Christ's resurrection, and to wait for Christ's return. A table that tells us to take courage from the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that is with us and invites us to offer praise up in everything and at all times. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. Oh God, most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We remember all of those who have been invited to this table. We remember the night of betrayal and that night of desertion. And in that moment, Jesus took bread and broke it and said to the disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and I know you can use your holy imagination after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we proclaim Christ's death, and we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and we await Christ's coming return again. Gracious God, as you bless these elements that we have gathered today in church, in our homes, in our cars, and may it be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this moment, in all of these spaces. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, make us the church united, your servant people, your survivor people, that we might be salt and light and leaven for the furtherance of your will in all the, all the world. Amen. These are the gifts of God for all of you. At this time, I'm going to invite you to consume your substances.
We give thanks to the Almighty God that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us into this world with courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Amen. Hello, United. Every Sunday we try to give you something to do, and this Sunday we have put on media how you can, and for those that are in Zoom land, don't worry, it will, the same information will come to you in our Thursday email, but it's information on how you can register so that you can vote by mail. We know that some people are feeling very apprehensive about coming to the polls, and so we want to encourage people, if this is you and you need to vote by mail, or if you're limited or you have some body challenges, age challenges, challenges, you might want to complete this. Um, there is time to get it done. Again, that information is on the screen, so we encourage you to make sure you register. If you have any problem getting to the polls, you have any challenges, I'm willing to chauffeur. We just want to make sure that people have all obstacles removed so that in this election they can vote. We encourage you to come out and vote because voting is our vo voice and voting is a way to make a difference. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing a pop-up in the park and I am going to invite people to come and meet me. Uh, and so uh, look forward to hearing more information. We will practice social distancing. <laughs> you can bring your lawn chairs and we can sit appropriately. You can definitely bring your mask, but would love to have fellowship. So in a couple of weeks, be looking for an announcement of a pop-up pastor. And if I get enough responses, I might even fix some popcorn. So uh, let us know, uh, give a holler, send me an email, call me. It's amazing that sometimes when I call people, they'll be like, oh, you haven't called me in a long time. And it's like, you guys, I love phone calls too. Feel free to call me if you wanna reach out. If you have concerns or you need to call your deacon, we encourage you that this relationship we have is two ways. So we hope that you are maintaining, you're nourishing, that you are staying sheltered, that you are staying safe. And we're so glad you decided to take time out of your schedule to be present and connected here at United today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is time for us to have our closing hymn and then we will have a benediction. God bless you. God be with you till we meet again By his counsels guide uphold you With his sheep securely fold you God be with you till we meet again Till we meet We are somebodies. We are survivors. We are survivors with stories. We are survivors with voices. We are survivors with feet and heart. We are survivors with spirit. Go with all of that and do good in the world and do justice in the world and walk humbly and nearer to your God. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.